Welcome to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast. This particular episode will involve a series of readings and, and discussions regarding an essay I wrote last year. The essay can be found on our website, plenteousredemption.com. That is plenteousredemption.com. You can click on the tab that says blog post, and then under the series of essays labeled missionary papers, you will find a series of essays written about the cross and the culture. Now, under this heading, th- this idea of the cross and the culture, they are written for the purpose of addressing certain cultural troubles from a biblical perspective. You got to keep that in mind as you listen to this and as you read those. These essays do not exist in form as expository Bible teaching, but rather prose meant to help the conservative understand absolute truth exists in agreement with certain so-called conservative ideas. So we, we don't, as Christians, debate over things like abortion, homosexuality. Uh, these are ideas that, that are clearly laid out in the Bible, and we have a form of absolute truth that we can turn to to get some help with those things. Now, these things are not up for debate. Once God has clearly prescribed an answer or a response to these things, we want to align our lives accordingly, and therefore the debate is over with. That, that's not to say there are not political matters or social matters that are not up for discussion and that need some, some uh, wise men to sit down and, and hammer out the proper direction to go. But overall, most of the issues that are being fought over today are, are uh, covered by the Word of God and the more closely aligned our country and our families and our societies are to, to uh, the biblical truth that God laid out, the better off we'll be. Now, this essay that we're going to look at today is called The Psychological Crutch of Christianity. And it's written, the title is written in question format because it's often a question that we run into. So I'll dive into the essay, and I'll stop from time to time as I, as I read through and, and discuss some of the ideas further. And I hope this is a help to you and a blessing to you. And, and those of you that maybe struggle with this idea or, or have a misunderstanding regarding this idea, I hope you get some guidance today. And, and I would love to do what I can to help you or, or to discuss it further. You can contact me in various ways. Um, just let me know what we can do. Now, is Christianity not a sort of psychological crutch? Questions are great. They reveal certain assumptions. As a Bible-believing Christian that spends a goodly amount of time street preaching, preaching in prisons, and preaching in rescue missions, I encounter many relevant questions. This one in particular reveals much regarding the thought process of the individual asking. Furthermore, the more common or repetitive a question is, I find they tend not to be original thoughts, but rather parodings of the discontents of some other larger influence. The, these ideas are commonly uh, taken from college professors or Hollywood stars or the news media. I'm amazed how often we stop someone on the street and begin to talk with them about the Word of God, and they want to speak to us in response on political ideas. And then to make matters worse, they, they, don't, they don't have their own thoughts regarding these political ideas. What they've done is memorize the CNN you know, news captions or the Fox news captions, or, or they've memorized a couple of catchphrases that their college professor throws out, and that's the extent of knowledge they have on the subject. They haven't done any reading. They haven't taken any time to do any definitive study. They, they, they just, someone they trust and someone they care about said something that seemed to resonate with them, and they picked it up and ran with it, regardless of, of whether there was any truth to it or not. They, they, they make no attempt to find out whether it's true in, in any way. But let's consider a few assumptions made here. The first assumption, Christianity is a mere crutch for the many in life that are somehow halt or lame, a prop for the weak and capable of standing firm under the weight of, of life. Now, that, that would be an incredibly arrogant, but it's an, an incredibly common thought process. That Christianity simply exists for people that are weak and that need some sort of help or a crutch to get them through life. 
just mark it down. If you think you've got so much control over life that you don't need God, you'll soon find out you were wrong. You'll soon find out you're misdirected. Something like, I don't know, a virus could appear and shut down the entire world's economy and show you very clearly you don't have as much control over your life as you think you do. And as the essay progresses, and I don't want to be redundant or get ahead of myself, the idea, this will be the for, primarily the idea that we tear down and that we try and take apart, is that the false assumption that Christianity is simply a crutch, <laughs> it's far more than a crutch, and you need far more than a crutch. You don't need something to just get you through life. You need God's help, which I hope to demonstrate to you as we go through this. But the second assumption is that uh, the psychologically impaired compose the makeup of Christianity as though sanity only exists in the secular world. And I, I have you know, friends that are atheists, and we engage in these discussions, and uh, they, they would also be relegated to the group of people that have, that have a, a massive lack in factual information on their side. And because they're, they're often so willing to make light of these discussions and joke about them, it's hard to pin them down and, and, and demonstrate that to them in any way because they're not interested in finding that out. Uh, one friend of mine, uh, we were in, in Afghanistan together in, at Camp Leatherneck, and uh, I tried to give him a Bible once. He was an atheist. I tried to give him a Bible, and, and he said, uh, no, thank you. I don't like fairy tales. And I responded by saying, you believe monkeys turned into people. <laughs> and, of course, these are two completely different worldviews at odds with each other, trying to demonstrate one to another which one is true, which one is based in any sense of reality or, or objective information, with each side really unwilling to hear the other. Now, I have examined both sides. I've tried to, to give an honest look at atheism and, and Darwinian evolution and, and uh, some of these, these ideas that seem to captivate people and help prevent them from coming to know the God that they should know and understand. And um, it, it required far more faith and it required far more, it required far more of me to believe in what they have come up with than it does for me to believe the Bible. Now, again, some of you, that won't work for you. You won't believe that. But the reality is you haven't taken the time to look into it. I can, I can say that with very little reservation. There will be very few of you who have ever really taken the time to take a, a real look into this matter to find out if there's any truth to, to where your, your position is, to where you stand on these issues. Instead, you've just, you have a, a, a presupposed idea and you're going to stick to it. Now, the essay continues, the members of society that tend to provide such verbal pandering also often stumble to their, to their cars in, dr in a drunken stupor. They don't need Christianity when weekly religious rituals of depleting finances at the local bar or nightclub will suffice. I once preached outside one such place of enlightenment, a bar called the Back Door, spelled B-A-C-K-D-O-U-R. You know, it, you, you got to stand out in this world. Why not, <laughs> why not use that to do it? Now, as, as one lewd fellow of the baser sword after another passed by, they zealously express their discontent with my God. I suppose he doesn't mix well with alcohol. And you're not going to win anybody over to your side. You're not, gonna, you're, not gonna, you're not helping your situation or your cause <laughs> when, you, when you stumble to your car half drunk and arrogantly tell me how there is no God or you don't believe in God or you don't need God or you don't want God. And... Often, we, we are ridiculed. We like to spend time out on the street. We hold signs. We may preach. We pass out tracts. We do various, various uh, public forms of ministry. And what happens is people drive by and they say, you're, you're driving people away. You're pushing people away. Away from what? They never really explain. And, and I think they often stop assuming that we are on the same side or same team or, or trying to accomplish the same things. And and I believe probably most of the time that's a false assumption. But regardless, those are not the groups that I'm really 
directing this next comment towards, why do they never stop someone that arrogantly espouses atheism or arrogantly espouses their, their lack of need for God, who is loud, stumbling drunk to go get into their car and then drive home? Why is it they never have anything to say about that? They will ridicule the street preacher who stands on the street and tries to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ, but they have nothing to say about the masses leaving a bar, having drinking all, having been drinking all night, and then get in their car and drive home. I fail to see, I fail to see the lack of connection here. <laughs> now, consider the assumption, especially coming from the masses that compose such groups. I do not need a crutch like Christianity. They have glorious weekends of drunken frolic to assist their hobbling. They don't realize their self-prescribed cure is just an extension of the frailty that is their life. When the highlight of a person's week consists of alcohol blackouts and perverse forms of sexual immorality, I would suggest far more than a crutch is needed. And that is often the, the highlight of their life. They have enough zeal for whatever it is they believe inside them to stop and incite an argument or a debate or, or at least a discussion with the person on the street corner. But the reality is they, get, they become angry very quickly because that person on the street corner who is sober, who is most likely well-dressed, and who is ready to engage in this type of discussion for the purpose of showing them the error in their ways, and, and the trouble in their life as a result of sin and, and, and sinful choices and activity in their life. And when that person is not ready, not as ready as they thought they were to engage in that discussion, they become very angry very quickly. The response is typically some form of righteous indignation. They can't believe that you would say these things or that you would point out these things or that you would suggest that their life is not as great as they would they would like you to think it is, and the fact that they are drunk and stumbling back to their vehicle is proof of that. When the highlight of your life is to save up your paycheck to end up at a bar to buy alcohol and drink into oblivion, or to sit at home and just drink yourself to sleep, I'm not convinced that you don't need God. <laughs> and I'm not convinced that you don't need His presence in your life and that you don't need His Word you're, you're doing a great job of convincing me otherwise. You need God. Now, also consider the crowd more dedicated to the religious use of alcohol than the weekend warrior. When preaching on the streets or in rescue missions, I encounter what society has dubbed alcoholics. The Bible calls them drunkards and deals harshly with such lifestyles. There have been fewer moments of illumination in life than when drunk, homeless individuals boldly declare they have no use for Christianity. They are sad sights to behold, their lives ravaged, relationships cut off, employment long gone, no sense of personal responsibility, but they have an opinion regarding the validity of the Christian life. And there couldn't be a more stark contrast. But, but they always want to make themselves known, and they always want to make sure their opinion is known. But then they become upset when the opinion is addressed. Now, I, I'm recording a program that's going, to go, that's going to go online that will sit there and be open to public scrutiny by as many people that, that, that uh, you know, feel that they should engage in that scrutiny. And by opening this up to the public, I am opening myself up to 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 the ridicule that may come with it or to the agreement that may come with it or to hopefully the discussion that may come along with it. That would be preferable. And so when you walk by on the street and I have a megaphone and you want to let me know that you disagree with what I'm doing, I in turn would like to also engage in the conversation and let you know that I disagree with your drunk frolicking and stumbling down the street to get into a car and then stumble between the lanes on the way home except that I have a megaphone, and I'm probably going to win. And even if I don't have the megaphone, I'm sober, and my mind is, is ready and able to engage in that type of conversation. If you're not really ready to engage in those conversations, my, my, my encouragement to you would be leave the street preacher alone. Because his goal and his aim should be, and I can't speak for every person that stands on the street and claims the name of Jesus Christ, but their aim should be to 
bring you into a form of conviction by way of preaching the word of God. And through that conviction, rather than you getting angry, you should submit to it and, and, and believe God and trust the Bible and trust what that preacher is saying in terms of the direction your life is going. Because this is, this is much bigger, as we'll see in a moment, much bigger than, than just the person that drinks on the weekend. It, it's, it's far more serious than that. And it's much bigger than the person that drinks himself to sleep every night. These are easy examples to pick on, as we'll see in just a moment. But we're talking about sin. And, and I'm, I'm trying to uh, cite a few examples of the realities in this world that prove you need God far more than you think you do. And your inability to go one weekend without blowing an entire paycheck on, on anything, whether it's a football game, whether it's, it's drinking, or whether it's, it's video games, whether it's drug abuse, or um, any number of issues that are going on in people's lives, these people need God. And they don't just need a crutch to help get them, you know, to help lift them a little bit out of alcohol, or lift them a little bit out of drug addiction, or lift them a little bit out of their addiction to pornography or, or video games or whatever the case may be, that society is, is ravaged by any number of addictions at any point in time. The problem is that the majority of society has so accepted this activity, it's no longer seen as an, as an addiction or something negative. It's an accepted form of life now. And we've gone so far down this road that you don't even realize it. That's why people get so angry when a man with a Bible opens it up and begins to read to them what God has to say about their lives and who they are. This false notion, this false idea that God is some big fluffy teddy bear in the sky that doesn't care what you do or where you go or what you drink or what you think or how you live, it's incorrect. It's just simply not true. I could demonstrate that to you from the Bible if you wanted it demonstrated to you. If you don't want to hear it, you're not going to, and you'll make certain that you stay in a place and in a position where you never find out what God really has to say about these things and about your life and about the direction you're going if you don't trust in Jesus Christ. Now, let's continue with the essay. The drunkard, whether speaking of the weekend warrior or the full-time overachiever, are easy to pick on from a biblical perspective. The Bible is so clear regarding not only the abuse, but simply the use of such substances. Proverbs 23, 29 through 35 describes with great brevity the, the vicious cycle of the life of an alcoholic. Also consider Proverbs 23, 21, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to, to poverty and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. As well as Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. This is not exclusive to individuals that drink. They just happen to be one example. The reality is individuals that rejected Christianity could have received help, a crutch, if you will. <laughs> they would have escaped financial ruin, sexual abuse, sexual perversion, laziness, lack of character, failing relationships, troubled families, etc., the Bible says God gave all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto glory and virtue. That's in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Yet people choose their own approach to life. They take offense at the suggestion there may be a better way, repeatedly proving the Bible they reject to be true. And that can be found in Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Biblical Christianity is strange to this world. Christians are odd because they use clean language. They don't drink or use drugs. They dress modestly, covering their flesh. Gender is not a point of confusion. They understand which restroom to use. Christians pay their own bills. They maintain their responsibilities. They are loyal to their spouse and shun divorce. This approach to life is considered odd to the world around us. That is so strange to me, but it's true. It, it's, it's unfortunately very true. I understand some who profess to be Christians have failed in one or more of these areas. The fact Christians have failed to uphold every area of biblical expectation does not infer trouble with Christianity. The Word of God exists as light and help to sinful man, and any that will submit thereto will walk in a helpful light. What's amazing is people whose lives are in complete disarray readily point out the failures and shortcomings of others. 
I'm not attempting to argue Christians are perfect, but rather that all men everywhere are imperfect and in need of God's help. Christianity is the solution, and Jesus is still the answer. And that has not changed since the beginning of time. Reliance upon God and and fidelity to God and trust in God and, and the light that God's word provides are extremely, extremely important. And to approach life without these things, it's one of two things. You're either extremely arrogant and think you have more control over your life than you actually do, or you are just genuinely ignorant of the realities of a relationship with God. You just simply don't understand your need. I have narrowed this down to you are either one of those two options. Now, I know that is incredibly simplified, but when you when you bring, break it down into such simple terms, it's hard to mistake the, 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 uh, the intent. And my aim is to show you that you need far more than a crutch. You need a complete overhaul. You need God's help. You need to be born again. You need to trust in Jesus Christ. You need to be washed and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. You need God. You need His Word. You need His light to escape darkness. You need His forgiveness to escape condemnation. You, you need His forgiveness to be justified. And, and you need justification. You need to be justified. But you can only be justified by faith in Jesus Christ. I, I hope you're getting the, the point. I hope you're getting the, the, the idea. You need Jesus Christ. A society that condemns individuals who believe thou shalt not kill is heading in a tumultuous direction. When an idea like thou shalt not commit adultery is vilified and the committing thereof is glorified, it is no wonder Christians stand out. In light of such contrasts, consider me a psychological misfit, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I can have sanity by being grounded and rooted in the Word of God. And by sanity, what I mean is I know how women dress, I know how men dress. I know that there's a difference between the two. I know that there's a men's restroom and I know that there's a women's restroom. I know the, I know the difference between the two. God warns that alcohol is dangerous and harmful, and, and because of that warning, I stay away from it. God says to have a sober mind, therefore I do all that I can to stay away from medication or drugs or anger or anything else that would captivate my sobriety and take it from me. These are biblical principles. These are biblical ideas that once implemented in a person's life so estrange you to the society around you they're not sure what to do with you, which is an odd thing to a, to a world of, uh, of, of people who believe that, that we're supposed to just accept all these differences within, within each group and, and, and within each society and within each culture. You're just supposed to just kind of be okay with all this. But if I show up with a King James Bible and begin to express what it is that, that I believe, well, that being okay with everything goes out the window. The Bible says, hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That's in 2 Timothy 1, verse 13. The life of a Christian is built upon sound truth provided by a holy God. The more an individual gives themselves over to God's word, the more stability they should expect. This comes with risk, being accused of lacking intelligence or psychological, uh, lacking psychological stability by the world. Ironically, a world that believes they cannot know anything for sure. Gender is malleable. Drunkenness is fun. Fornication is a sport. I'm not certain how they know they can't know anything, but we will stick with the Bible. You can venture down the road with ideas that you can't know anything, which to have those ideas or that knowledge assumes that you know that, which of course means the entire philosophy breaks down in the onset. Again, once you simplify things, and, and it falls apart at the point of simplification, it's time to abandon it. It doesn't work. But, but they cling to it. They hold to it. Their professor said it must be so, and therefore the, the professor's word is, is equivalent to God's word in their eyes, and they cling to it as though it is infallible truth, even though they don't believe in infallible truth. So I'll stick with the word of God. It hasn't changed. My King James Bible is exactly the same as it was uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, your science book is ever-changing, and I understand that some of you think that's a good thing, <laughs> but 
uh, it's, it's actually very problematic and very troublesome. Scientific fact, something that is scientifically proven should not, if it's factual, if it's truth, if it is proven, it should not then change 10 years down the road. But it does. It does continually because science today is based on theory. It's not based on factual information. And a person in, in, ru- in a rush to make a name for themselves or to, an establish, to establish an uh, a, a doctorate will put out any tr- anything that they can in any form that they can to, to establish that name just so they can get ahead. Not necessarily because it's true, not necessarily because it's going to help anyone. Well, the Word of God has not changed. You can depend on it. It hasn't changed. And, and the only people that try and make changes to it are in the same boat as the group that change your science book every year. They're just trying to make money. They're just trying to establish a name for themselves. The King James Bible is the same, just like the Lord Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. One doctrine highly promoted by the world is that of tolerance which actually means believe what we believe and live like we live so we can tolerate you. Such models, of to- such models of tolerance commonly respond to biblical morality with righteous indignation. They offer no valid replacement for biblical standards, just shouting and name-calling dissidents into submission. Regardless of the depravity of their behavior, if they could just convince Bible-believing bigots to forsake their moral standards— What a utopia this world could be. A bloody and wicked utopia, but a utopia nonetheless. It's so important to understand. The Bible says there's a way. We read it a few minutes ago. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. These people are, are so clinging to the current doctrine that they have at this current time, and it's it's fluid. It changes drastically and quickly as needed. Not because some new truth was found not because some more helpful way was found. It's typically reactive. It's reactionary uh, in response to the political situation at the time, mostly. And so there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. What I want you to see is that if you could have your way all the time, every time, what you would end up with is death. And as our streets, as... as uh, as violence becomes worse and worse, people being harmed in the, in the most uh, disgusting ways becomes worse and worse. Drug addiction becomes worse and worse. And, and cities where these ideas, especially ideas of tolerance and this doctrine of tolerance, which, which is unbelievably intolerant, as it, as it permeates our major cities where these drug problems uh, are, are at their worst, are, at their, are, are, are expanding daily, continually, these ideas are at the root of it. And implementing this thought process is at the root of it. it it's your thinking, and it's this idea that you don't need God, you don't need accountability, you don't need any objective information to help guide or direct your, your, your statements or your thinking or, or your direction. You, you don't need anything based in truth. And the utopia they want is San Francisco, covered in homeless people and needles and drugs. And Seattle, covered in homeless people and needles and drugs. And we could name Philadelphia and, and Boston and, and New York. And you could just name one major city after the other that's experiencing the exact same problems where these ideas exist. But you walk into a, a church that uses a King James Bible, and you find people whose, people whose lives are being put back together, people whose lives are being strengthened and being built, people that are, that are exiting the doctrines and the lifestyles of this world and moving more and more to a life based on biblical truth where, where they're throwing out the drug addiction and they're throwing out the alcoholism and they're, they're throwing out the spouse abuse and the child abuse and the pornography and, and everything else that, that, that so plagues this world, and their lives begin to, to, to form and to become more peaceful and to, and to be brought in, into a form of control and to move progressively in the right direction, thanks to God and His Word. You could have the bloody utopia that this world wants, or you could have peace, joy, happiness, 
love, long suffering, all these wonderful things that God would like to give you. Those, those essentially are those are your only two options. In the public realm, it's difficult for Bible believing Christians to have discussions along these lines. The conversation requires some basis in reality. Unfortunately, we are facing a world that abandoned reality long ago. Apparently, it was bigoted and lacked tolerance, so the world asked it to leave. This detachment must exist to help facilitate corrupt narratives. Object objective facts are relevant to individuals intending to live life with reality in view. Otherwise, biblical truth and objective data is offensive and will be shouted down, not because they are wrong, but they offend the weak psyches of Neverland. Life comes with responsibility. The Bible defines those responsibilities and instructs us on how to maintain them. All men everywhere are expected to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Once reconciled, we are to maintain a relationship with God. Ample time in the Bible is required to understand this relationship. The world around us at this point is insane. Psychology once was man's attempt to define, explain, and direct this insanity, but now is a weapon used to attack dissidents. Christians, on the other hand, are to be separate from this world and its insanity. This can only happen through adherence to biblical truth regardless of the tantrums of the world. We, we don't let the fits that people throw dictate whether we believe the Bible or not. We don't let the, the whining or the crying or the shouting or the name-calling or anything else that they do dictate whether we're going to stick with the Word of God or not. We believe the Word of God is, it, it, is as it is in truth, and we're going to stick with the Word of God. Finally, I would take things a step further. Christianity is more than a crutch. It is the very foundation for every aspect of life. Without the foundation, life is on shaky ground. Anything labeled Christianity that is void of God's word is Christian in name only. Since, as the sparks fly upward, man's natural tendency is toward trouble, the solution will always be to make decisions based upon clear biblical teaching. This will remove the painful limp through life, and it pleases God. Jesus himself said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's in Luke 19.10. The trouble with being lost is we don't realize it until we have gone too far out of the way. But an unfortunate difference between driving the highways and living life, when driving, people will go to great length to get back on track once they realize they are lost. They will drive overtime to make up the lost ground if necessary. Yet through the course of life, they do all they can to prevent the realization they are lost. They lash out at anyone who would suggest they have sinned against a righteous God. They prefer to travel the lonely and burdensome highways rather than turning to God for help. They will do everything they can to stay on the wrong road, even if a little light got in there to show them they are heading in the wrong direction. They will not turn that car around. They will not repent and trust God. But you can. The option is available to you. You could do it today. You could do it right now. And if you decide not to, I hope you will at least consider it or engage in proper conversation in that regard. Don't just dismiss this without, without giving it serious consideration and serious thought. The Lord also said, when Jesus heard it, he, sa he saith unto them, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Bible also says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance, and there is none righteous. This fact naturally includes all men everywhere. Christianity is not a mere crutch for a few people that need assistance. It's the solution for all things pertaining to life and godliness. Christ died for sinners to save them from the condemnation they deserve. Jesus did not die on the cross to help a few people that needed a little crutch. He died for the sins of the world. If you have never placed your trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, you are more than halt or lame. You are condemned. You can read more about that in John 3, verse 18. I encourage you to escape that condemnation. Escape with the same fervor you would, you would conjure in preparation for a zealous night out on the town. So that, that, in a nutshell, is the essay. And those are some brief discussions regarding some of the topics in the essay. You can read it uh, more clearly and, and probably better than I at PlenteousRedemption.com. You can hear 
this audio and others on YouTube at, at Plenteous Redemption, or you can go to plenteousredemption.media to, to learn more about our podcast. The idea, again, of these essays is to take the, the conservative thinker or, the, or the, the person that would identify as a Republican, but you really don't know why, and to show you that, that over the course of these essays, it's intended to show you that there is actual foundational biblical truth that inspires these ideas in the hearts and the minds of, of Christians. And, and I would separate being a Christian from, being, from simply being a conservative and separate being a Christian from simply being a Republican. It's a false idea that they are one and the same. A Republican or a conservative is someone that has, that has reasoned within themselves that certain uh, conservative and Republican ideas resonate with them. That's not, that's not true for the Christian. The Christian is someone that believes God and believes what he says in his word, and therefore, as a result, the platform politically that tends to agree with that the most just happens to be that of, of the Republican platform. And you have to be able to separate the two and know why you land on one side or the other. If all you've done is reason out in your own mind why you should be a Republican, someone could come along and convince you otherwise, and you could be taken away. You can change your mind tomorrow. There are a number of Democrats that were Republicans and Republicans that were Democrats and, and have jumped back and forth along that line, and the reason is because they're just convinced in their own mind that that's what they should be. They have no real reason otherwise to do so. It's just their opinion. Well, the word of God is not my opinion. My opinion is being made to conform with the word of God and the truth therein. I hope this is a help to you. Again, our website is plenteousredemption.com. Please contact us if we can be a help in any way. And God bless you. Thank you for listening.